Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. A flurry of activity as the legislative session comes to an end. Ahead, a rundown of what lawmakers accomplished during this short session and what issues we're sure to see resurface next year. And Hoosiers will benefit, benefit from that, that we have, we'll have more doctors practicing in our state and, and hopefully more access. How early is too early for students to start class? It's a complicated question and one that school districts are struggling with. Next, we look at one school district that is delaying its start times and why critics say it's still not enough. In our district, we have two bus routes that run in the morning, and so this was kind of a compromise. This tree on the State House lawn has quite the story behind it. Well, the White House got one, the Emperor of Japan got one, and Indianapolis got one, and this is the tree. Coming up, why this tree is the subject of so much attention. These stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. The Seymour Cummins plant is closed until Monday after two people died there in an apparent murder suicide. Police say it appears Ching Shin shot and killed his supervisor, Ward Edwards, before killing himself. The shooting happened early Thursday morning on the second floor of the plant's technical building. Shocked workers ran outside after they heard gunshots. We were escorted through to just go get our car keys, personal belongings, obviously, because everybody left with nothing. So the plant is just in a quiet state. Everything shut down, no machinery run-ins. Dozens of police and local SWAT teams arrived within minutes of the shooting. Police say they found a 9mm handgun at the scene. I want to commend the um, Seymour Police Department, the state police. I want to thank the governor for coming as well. Um, the support's really, really necessary at this time. Cummins will offer counseling to all employees. Now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on the rest of this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Indiana's attorney general is officially appealing a federal judge's ruling that the state can't block funds from Syrian refugees coming to Indiana. He is also requesting a stay on the judge's decision until the appeals court rules. Governor Pence ordered state agencies to stop resettling Syrian refugees in November due to concerns over the federal government's screening process. Exodus Refugee Immigration filed a lawsuit in response and plans to continue with resettlement efforts even if they lose grant funding. An Indiana University student says her sexual assault case was mishandled because the person overseeing the review process was accused of sexual assault himself. Freshman Haley Ryle filed a Title IX complaint against IU Bloomington after finding out Title IX coordinator Jason Casares was accused of sexually assaulting a woman at a conference in December. Casares has since resigned. Ryle says she's speaking out about her complaint to help raise awareness. I'm speaking out with my name and my face because I think that when there's a name and a face to such a huge situation like this, it's easier for people to pay attention and to try to sympathize or understand. IU is conducting an independent review of all cases Casares oversaw during this academic year. That includes Ryle's case. A university spokesperson says IU is aware of the Title IX complaint, but believes it treated Ryle's case with fairness and respect. 
The courts and now legislators are trying to determine whether private university police departments have to comply with Indiana's public records laws. This comes in the wake of a lawsuit ESPN filed against Notre Dame trying to get the university police to comply with a public records request and hand over information about its interactions with student athletes. A bill sitting on the governor's desk declares private university police departments public agencies, but at the same time says they are exempt from some public records laws. Under the proposal, those departments wouldn't have to turn over any investigatory records. The way the law is written, they will have to release information about arrests, they'll have to release information about people put in jail. Um, but they don't have to release um, any information. Well, they don't have to release much information about that vast majority of other contacts with people, incidents, accidents, um, and so forth that don't result in, res in arrest or jail. The legislation comes as the University of Notre Dame and ESPN await a state appeals court's decision on whether the university police should have to comply with public records requests. Notre Dame argues because it's a private institution, its police department is exempt from those laws. And I don't understand uh, really what the rationale is for um, treating uh, these particular police departments differently from any other police department in the state. They exercise the same sorts of um, powers under the state's general police powers. They can make arrests, they can use deadly force. So I think they ought to be subject to the same public records requirements. A Superior Court judge ruled in favor of the University of Notre Dame versus in the ESPN versus Notre Dame case last year. Since then, the attorney general filed a friend of the court brief siding with ESPN, saying transparency and openness is essential with every police department. The appeals court could issue a decision in the coming weeks. More than $40 million in grants from the Lilly Endowment will help several southern Indiana counties improve their economic outlooks. As J.D. Gray reports, Lilly announced the investment during an event at Crane. The funding will cover the cost of implementing an education and workforce plan, as well as a regional opportunity fund for quality of place investments in the area. And when we will look back 10, 20 years from now and say, wow, Look at what that grant helped spawn in this region. Look at the things that have panned out for the citizens in our communities. Regional leaders completed a strategic plan for southwest central Indiana in 2014, aimed at improving economic development and prosperity. The grants will help them address the five obstacles outlined in that report, including the need for more collaboration between Indiana University and Crane and the shortage of skilled workers. Think about the opportunity uh, that you all have now before you. Real opportunity, $42 million in grants. Uh, that's certainly not an end. I know it's the beginning uh, of things, but a real opportunity uh, to do some exceptional things. For Indiana News Desk, I'm J.D. Gray. A familiar face at DePaul University will serve as the school's new president. Mark McCoy will take over as president beginning July 1st. He served as the dean of the School of Music since 2011. Current president Brian Casey is leaving to become the president of Colgate University in New York. Well, it will cost twice as much to fix a historic Paoli Bridge than it will to build a new one. Truck driver Mary Lambright ignored weight limit signs and drove over the bridge on Christmas Day, causing it to collapse. The bridge remains closed as the county and insurance company try to reach an agreement on repairs. Fixing the structure would cost more than $1 million, so the insurance company wants to go the cheaper route and build a new bridge. But residents are protesting. It's, it's history, you know, like my husband says, when you come up through there, you see that old bridge and then the old courthouse lined up right with it. It's just something you're used to. The county's attorney is considering all options for restoring the historic bridge. Paoli Peaks is closed for the season. As Sarah Whitmire reports, the mild winter was not good for business or for skiers who wanted to enjoy the slopes. It was a short season for skiers. Paoli delayed its opening until after the first of the year because of mild weather and now had to shut down sooner than expected as well. With southern Indiana weather, we've learned that you may have years where you have quite a bit of snowfall and then two years later you may have none. It just varies greatly. One of the 
wonderful things about being here is the ability to make snow. With 110 snow guns, we, if Mother Nature doesn't give us what we want, we are able to make what we want. Crick says overall the resort still had a decent season. Paoli now will not fully reopen until winter 2016-2017. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sarah Whitmire. The countdown to the Hall of Fame is starting. Former Indianapolis Colts quarterback Peyton Manning announced his retirement this week. Manning leaves behind a legacy of football victories and philanthropic gifts in Indianapolis. If you were an Indianapolis Colts fan, you're a Peyton fan for life. Um, I mean, we're always going to embrace him and hopefully he does come back and make some appearance in Indianapolis. And Joe, the Colts are actually planning a special event in honor of the five-time MVP later this month. All right, thanks, Barbara, and I'm sure many Hoosiers are anxious to see Manning return to Absolutely. Indianapolis. Well, the 2016 legislative session is over. Let's take a look at which bills made it to the governor. The state will spend a billion dollars next year on Indiana's roads. The governor met with House and Senate leaders behind closed doors this week. The result is a plan that pulls money from the state's surplus and local income tax reserve money. The bill does not include a cigarette or gas tax, but it does allow for local taxes to be put in place. There is al also a matching grant fund for local road improvements. The road funding package also creates a task force compromised of state and local officials to develop a long-term funding plan over the summer. Tucked into the bill is also funding for three regional cities initiatives. A bill banning abortions under specific circumstances is on the governor's desk. The bill bans abortions performed solely because of a fetus's sex, race, or disability. The bill also bans the disposal of fetal remains as medical waste. Indiana's Division of Mental Health and Addiction have until the end of the year to create new guidelines for addiction treatment providers. Currently, methadone clinics are only allowed to offer methadone as medication. A bill awaiting the governor's signature creates other addiction treatment options. The General Assembly also approved a bill to make naloxone more accessible. The opioid overdose drug is currently only accessible with a prescription. The bill makes it available without a prescription. The state's standardized assessment, the ICE step is gone. Lawmakers voted to get rid of it. A bill on its way to the governor creates a panel to find a new standardized test to replace it. This committee will decide how Indiana's assessment will change, and it will also have the power to address one of the biggest criticisms of the current ICE step assessment plan, the high stakes. A bill containing controversial language about collective barg bargaining for teachers and school vouchers passed both chambers. School districts can give advanced placement teachers bonuses without consulting the teachers union. The bill also allows students to apply for a, te uh, to apply for a voucher twice during an academic year and opponents say this will cause a higher enrollment in the program and cost the state more money. Getting a hold of police body camera footage could get easier in the coming months. Legislators passed the final version of a bill this week that allows video footage to be released to the public and media unless the police can prove in court that it should not be. A provision was removed that would have automatically released footage if an officer was using excessive force. The bill does allow police to charge up to $150 for copies of the footage. A bill that would allow for alcohol permits at state parks without local input is awaiting the governor's signature. Recently, a developer ap applied for a liquor license at Dune State Park. Residents and environmental groups were against the application, and a local board rejected the, de the developer's liquor license at Dune State Park. If Pence signs the bill, the, de the developer will be able to apply for a permit despite the board's rejection. The medical malpractice cap increases from its current limit of 1.25 million to 1.8 million by 2019. It's the first increase in nearly two decades. The bill now heads to conference committee. Our Supreme Court has previously stated that uh, for this to be constitutional, uh, they felt it was necessary for the legislature from time to time raise the caps to keep it abreast of, of the cost of living increases that we all experience from time to time, and that's what this does. House and Senate lawmakers sent a bill to the governor that codifies HIP 2.0, the state's health care program. Some lawmakers worried the bill would make it harder to make changes to the health care program. 
Lawmakers sent a bill to the governor that puts restrictions on how much pseudoephedrine some Hoosiers can buy. Pharma pharmacists can sell small amounts of pseudoephedrine to previous customers and to any customer they're familiar with. A brand new customer looking for larger amounts of the drug would need to have a prescription. The session might be remembered as much for what was not accomplished as for what was. The General Assembly failed to produce a definitive position on LGBT civil rights. Early in the session, some lawmakers fought to find a compromise, but the debate ended on the Senate floor. Democrats tried to keep it alive, introducing several amendments on the subject throughout the session's second half, but they were turned down. Governor Mike Pence issued a statement last night calling the session a win for Indiana, pointing to the Rhodes Bill, the I-Step repeal, and a string of measures aimed at curbing drug abuse. His Democratic opponent in the gubernatorial race, John Gregg, issued a statement slamming, quote, missed opportunities to approve long-term road funding and grant civil rights protections to gay and transgender Hoosiers. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Some students will get to sleep a little later next year. We'll explain why more schools are changing the start times and the impact it has on learning. The U.S. sent the first man to the moon, but we didn't stop there. How a piece of space history made its way back to Earth and Indiana. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. <laughs> I can change the world with my own two hands, make it a better place with my own two hands. I'm going to make it a brighter place with my own two hands. I'm going to help the human race with my own two hands. Hold you in my own two hands, and I can comfort you with my own two hands. With my own, with my own two hands. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The Centers for Disease Control says less than one in five middle and high school students is starting the school day late enough for optimal learning and health. The Monroe County Consolidated School Corporation recently announced its changing start times. Barbara Brozier joins us now. Barbara, how big of a change are we talking about? Well, the changes will impact students in the, all students in the corporation. They'll start school at least 20 minutes later than they do now, but that's still not as late as most experts recommend. It's 6.45 in the morning, and Georgie Stevens's Bloomington neighborhood is pitch black. A few lights line the street, but you can barely see her standing on the corner waiting for the bus. It's very, very dark out. Uh, and it really is pretty much pitch black from mid-November to mid-February. Uh, it, it just in five or ten minutes you'll see it start getting a little lighter in the sky. The birds in the neighborhood seem to be more awake than the kids. They're out here in time to catch a bus at 6.50 every day but Wednesday when the school district has a late start. Our morning routine is our alarm goes off at 6. Uh, and even on the late day Wednesday she will keep her alarm at 6 and she gets up and she watches a little TV and has her cereal and gets dressed. Jenny Stevens is happy. Her daughter's morning will start a little later come August. The Monroe County Consolidated School Corporation announced last month it will change school start times for all students. At the elementary level, school will start at 9 instead of 835. Middle and high school students won't have their first classes until 8. That's instead of 740 and the school corporation is getting rid of late start days. I feel really good that they've moved it back to eight because I think that just that extra 20 minutes will really be helpful. But it's not quite what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends. In a 2014 policy statement, the organization said middle and high school students need eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep, so they shouldn't start school before 830. 
According to U.S. Department of Education data, from the 2011 to 2012 school year, more than 75 percent of Indiana's public schools started the day before 830. The CDC says that it uh, has led to increases in levels of obesity among teenagers, uh, that it can uh, increase um, uh, rates of uh, depression among those teenagers. Uh, there's some evidence, and depending on how you interpret it, that um, uh, student achievement falls and isn't as high as if they're getting sufficient hours of sleep. The problem is pushing start times back for all students is almost logistically impossible for most of Indiana's school corporations. It would require larger bus fleets, something cash-strapped corporations can't afford. Transportation is also what prohibited us from saying, you know what, across the board, all 11,000 students start at 8.30 a.m. That would that'd be ideal if we can have everyone start at the same time, but very few corporations are able to do that. So Monroe County came to what it considers a pretty good compromise, and it's a decision the corporation spent years studying before implementing. They surveyed teachers to ask what they saw in their classrooms, and the overwhelming majority responded by saying students were fatigued. When we lengthened the day in 2011 for elementary kids, it got an hour longer per day. And what we were hearing consistently was that hour was too long, that kids were exhausted at the end of the day. It was difficult to keep their focus. The school corporation is hopeful. Starting the day just a little bit later will have a positive impact on student achievement and health. And the majority of parents see it as a positive change, too. I myself don't want to get up that early. I like to get up at between 7 and 7.15, so I miss the elementary days. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. School start times vary depending on the corporation. In Fort Wayne, elementary students start their day at 820. The middle school starts at 720 and the high school doesn't start until 905. In an Indianapolis, elementary kids start at nine while the secondary schools kick off the day at 730. That is so early, Joe. <laughs> Yeah, but it's interesting that the story, too, is more just about students. There are a lot of other factors <laughs> into that decision. Absolutely. Thank you, Barbara. Well, with the recent return of astronaut Scott Kelly, scientists are attempting to see how a year in space affects the human body. But decades ago, scientists were interested in learning more about the impact space has on other living things. The Apollo 14 lunar mission launched in 1971, sending men to the moon for the third time. As Lindsay Wright reports on this particular mission, there was more than just three astronauts aboard. It looks kind of like a normal tree to me. You know, maybe second generation will be something ailing and weird. I don't know. It doesn't look like much now, but this sycamore tree right outside the state house has done more than most of us will do in a lifetime. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff with Apollo 14. Along with 499 other seedlings, it tagged along on the Apollo 14 lunar mission and orbited the moon 34 times. The command module pilot, Stuart Rusa, who previously worked as a smoke jumper for the National Forestry Service, decided to take a mixture of sycamore, redwood, and walnut seeds to space. And these, tree, these seeds were given to Stuart Rusa by the National Forestry Service. Uh, for this particular experiment to see if that long exposure, nine days exposure to microgravity and cosmic radiation would cause any differences in the growth of the trees once the seeds were planted. 420 of the seeds were potted and observed in Mississippi for several years. After they appeared to be normal, the rest were given away. Greg McCauley is the current executive director of the Link Observatory in Mooresville. He arrived in Texas to work for NASA shortly after Apollo 14 launched. And as he puts it, everyone wanted a moon tree. The White House got one, the Emperor of Japan got one, and Indianapolis got one. And this is the tree. There are around 75 known locations of the moon trees today, including a few other yeah. spots in Indiana. Because records weren't always kept, individuals are still trying to track some of the locations. The state planted the moon tree outside the state house on April 9, 1976, as part of Arbor Day and the nation's bicentennial celebration. Macaulay encourages everyone to go see it and remember those special days of space exploration. And to have something like this growing, that was a part of that program. It actually went to the moon and back. Some of the astronauts, most of them, the Apollo astronauts, have passed away. This tree lives on. 
For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. The Link Observatory is dedicated to teaching about space science. They partnered with NASA to make outer space more accessible to students, and they are bringing space exploration into the classroom. A group of elementary school students from St. Pius X filters into a classroom for a special presentation. The school is only one of four across the country connecting with an astronaut via a digital video feed. Students give a thumbs up to let the NASA employees know the signal is clear. Former astronaut Bruce Melnick speaks to four classrooms simultaneously using a live feed from the Kennedy Space Center. He talks about life in space and answers students' questions. We bring up our own nitrogen, and we bring up our own oxygen, and we make our own air to breathe while we're in the space shuttle. Melnick says even the simplest daily routines change in space. For example, without gravity, astronauts use Velcro to attach their sleeping bags to a wall. Because there is no up or down in space. The Link Observatory partnered with NASA to bring space into the classroom. They see it as an opportunity to get kids interested in science. Periodically, they will give us a call when they have one of these opportunities come up and say, do you have any schools might be interested in talking with an astronaut in this case. The Link Observatory hopes to connect more schools with astronauts and space education in the future. And that's all the time we have. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana. SIPhysicians.org, IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, working to improve cybersecurity and provide policy guidance through partnerships with industry, government, and academia. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.